Welcome to the Dr. Bub's Performance Podcast, giving you the latest evidence-based research and cutting-edge insights for elite mental and physical performance. He's connecting you directly with the world's leading experts and coaches. Here's your host, Dr. Bubs. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Dr. Bubs Performance Podcast. I'm really excited to have on today a phenomenal guest, obesity and diabetes expert, Dr. Jason Fung, MD, who is going to take a deep dive into the chronically high blood sugar, high insulin, and diabetes type 2 epidemic that we're seeing today across all Western countries. He's going to discuss the flaws in the calories in versus calories out model for weight loss, how hyperinsulinemia is chronically high insulin levels across the board or one of the root causes, especially the long-term root causes of weight gain and poor health, the role of constant snacking throughout the day, and of course, lack of sleep and stress and how all those things come together to impact uh, insulin function or healthy insulin function. He'll also dive into dietary practices to lower uh, chronically high insulin levels, as well as the role of fasting in his phenomenal new book, The Complete Guide to Fasting, how that can be a simple, easy, actionable item to incorporate into your regime to dramatically uh, improve weight loss and overall health. So as usual, you can find my layups and performance hacks at drbubs.com forward slash podcast. If you have any questions, please post them at Dr. Bubs on Twitter or Facebook, and I hope you enjoy the show. I'm joined today by Dr. Jason Fung, who earned his medical degree at the University of Toronto, where he's also completed his internal residency before heading to the University of California, Los Angeles, for his fellowship in nephrology. He currently practices as a kidney specialist in Toronto. He is the chief of the Department of Medicine at Scarborough General Hospital. In addition to clinical medicine, he's also on the board of directors of Low Carb Diabetes Association and the scientific editor of the Journal of Insulin Resistance. During the course of treating thousands of patients, it became clear to Dr. Fung that the epidemic of type 2 diabetes and obesity was getting worse. The prevailing recommendations to reduce dietary fat and calories were clearly ineffective. Thus, he founded the Intensive Dietary Management Program to provide a unique treatment focus for type 2 diabetes and obesity. Rather than focusing on medications, this clinic focuses on dietary changes that are simple yet effective. In March 2016, Greystone Books published Dr. Fung's first book, The Obesity Code, which explores the underlying hormonal imbalance that leads to obesity and recommends effective strategies to address the root cause. And his second book, The Complete Guide to Fasting, was published in October 2016, which is a practical guide to all matters related to fasting, including fasting regimens, what to expect, how to deal with problems, and simple remedies. Jason, really appreciate you taking the time out today to join us. Well, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Jason, before we dive into how we've gotten ourselves into this obesity and type 2 diabetes epidemic, can you tell us a little bit more about that period in your career where you, uh, you, know, you made that shift and, and began to, to, to create the, the intensive dietary management program? Yeah, it, it started somewhere around the mid 2000s, somewhere around 2008, I would say. And there was a couple of big studies that uh, were uh, kind of going on, and the results were very, very interesting. So there was two kind of things: one from on a diabetes side, and one on an obesity side. And one of them was the all the publications of the low carb trials, which were starting to come out somewhere in the mid 2000s. So what happened was that around 2000, the Atkins diet became very popular. It kind of got a second resurgence. So there's a whole lot of low-carbing and stuff, and um, people were eating a lot of high-fat foods, and uh, doctors like myself thought it was really just a really bad idea because the prevailing wisdom at the time was to eat very low fat, of course. Mm -hmm. And what was really interesting was that the studies showed that low carbohydrate diets were actually much, much better in terms of weight loss, but also, and this was the big surprise, uh, in terms of the entire metabolic profile. So blood sugars were better, cholesterol numbers were much better. So everything seemed to be better with a low carbohydrate diet. Longer follow-up studies showed kind of that the weight loss was similar, but nevertheless, my uh, main interest was the kind of metabolic syndrome uh, markers, and that was still better with the low-carbohydrate diet. So that was what was really interesting from my side of things. But then right after that, there came uh, some studies that really shook up the world of type 2 diabetes. So again, in type 2 diabetes, the focus had always been on 
on reducing blood sugars. So the prevailing wisdom of the time was really to give as much medication as necessary to get that blood sugar down with the understanding that if you lower the blood sugar, then everything else gets better. So heart disease, kidney disease, eye disease. And it turns out that that was completely untrue. In fact, the ACCORD study, which was the first of its kind, showed that intensive control in type 2 diabetes made things worse. That is, the death rate was higher in those people who got more insulin, and that was completely counterintuitive. Um, and it wasn't a single study. There was multiple studies, most that showed there was no difference. That is, if you're taking a lot of medication or if you're taking a little bit of medication to get those blood sugars down, it didn't really matter. So whether you took your medication or not, there is no measurable benefit uh, to it, which completely shook up the field of uh, type 2 diabetes. Unfortunately, what happened was that people kind of, for the most part, just kind of kept on practicing. But it really got me to thinking that type 2 diabetes, we had the entire disease pegged all incorrectly because here we were focusing on getting the blood glucose down and pretending that that was the actual disease. But that's not the disease. Type 2 diabetes is the disease. It causes you to have high blood sugars, but lowering those blood sugars doesn't um, make the disease any better. That is, you could lower blood sugars, but you weren't making the type 2 diabetes get better. And once you started to think of it that way, everything kind of became, all the kind of uh, logical fallacies became obvious. That is to say that, well, type 2 diabetes is not actually a incurable progressive disease because lots of people reverse their type 2 diabetes. If somebody comes to you and they lose 50 pounds and their diabetes goes away, you say, great job. Well, you've just proven right there that type 2 diabetes is not chronic and progressive, but you focused on the correct thing, which is causing the weight loss rather than blood getting blood glucose down. So we had been giving insulin, which causes weight gain. So we weren't making things better. We were making things worse. And it turns out that almost all the patients could see it. They're all like, doctor, you know, you're giving me this insulin. I gained 50 pounds. How is that good? You always tell me to lose weight, but you give me a drug that makes me gain 50 pounds. Exactly. And it turns out they were entirely correct. We were doing the wrong thing. We were treating the symptoms, which is the high blood glucose, and pretending that that was the actual disease of diabetes, and it wasn't. So that's how I kind of came around to really getting very interested in the question of obesity because obviously – it flows logically. One, I treat diabetic kidney disease because I'm a kidney specialist. Mm -hmm. And again, it becomes obvious if you want to prevent diabetic kidney disease, you need to get rid of the diabetes because that is possible. If you want to get rid of the diabetes, you need to lose weight. So therefore, how do you lose weight? And that's really what kind of set me off into really, really going into the question of what causes weight gain. Because the way I look at disease is always what's the causal agent? What's the root cause? Because you have to treat that in order to properly manage the disease. You need to know what causes it. If you don't know what causes it, then you, you can't fix that. Absolutely. So, all, those, all those symptoms, all the smoke that we tend to treat, which is what you mentioned there with the blood sugars, is definitely, uh, you know, once you address that root cause, then all, all that smoke tends to clear. Now, in, in your book, you mentioned in the obesity code, you, you go through a thorough treatment of the calories in, calories out. I imagine that's a big part of, uh, obviously, your protocols. Can you, can you talk everyone through the, the, a lot of the myths around the, the calories model of, of weight gain? Yeah, and this is one of their big problems is that the kind of root core belief that we have that obesity is due to too many calories is completely incorrect. Uh, this is the whole issue is that we all think that it's a calorie imbalance, right? If you eat more calories, then you'll gain weight. If you eat less calories, then you'll lose weight. But it's not actually true. And you can prove it experimentally. It's been done over and over over the, uh, over the past 100 years. So if you try to overfeed people, that is make them eat a lot, they will gain weight temporarily. But then very quickly are, their basal metabolism will rise and try and burn it off. If you make people eat less calories than usual, that is cut their calories, their bodies will slow down and they won't burn as many calories. So therefore, if you look at it that way, you see that you're kind of not going to win. If you raise your calories in, 
then you raise your calories out. Weight stays relatively stable. If you lower your calories in, your calories out goes down and you also don't win. Your weight stays stable. So in the end, that was a really bad strategy. And when, when you go back through it, um, the body doesn't really have any mechanism to kind of count calories or measure calories. So why would we think it's important? I mean, you can take a thousand calories of cookies and a thousand calories of salmon and salad. And as soon as you eat them, they're the same number of calories, but the hormonal response to those foods is completely different. One will stimulate insulin, one won't. One will stimulate things such as peptide YY, cholecystokine, and other hormones. The body knows how to respond to these hormones. That's the kind of common currency of the body. That is, the body knows what to do with these sort of um, – hormonal signals. So for instance, if you have a lot of insulin, your body responds in a certain way. That is to lay down new fat. If it has low insulin, then it will tend not to gain fat. So that's what's really important because the, the to, to the body, calories are an entirely foreign language. It has no way to understand how many calories are going in because it doesn't measure it. So if your body doesn't care, why would we care? Why do we think it's so important to measure calories? Uh, and, and, and that's really the core belief that we've kind of drilled into our kids and told everybody we have calorie labels, we count calories, we you know see how much exercise you need to burn off a certain number of calories. But the entire underlying premise of calories is completely incorrect. It's completely unphysiologic. So that's where we get into trouble and that's the root – problem is that we think it's a calorie deficit. Your body doesn't care about calories at all. And so we are not able to kind of make our bodies lose weight because we're trying to, you know, make a, make a, you know, make ourselves eat less calories and the body still responds to hormones. So if you eat less calories, but your insulin response is the same, that is you eat a lot of sugar, a lot of carbohydrates, that kind of thing, then you're not going to lose weight. And that's that's really where you have to understand the science of weight gain. And that's why I really spend a lot of time talking about calories. Um, this whole thing about the, – there's another thing they talk about, which is the first law of thermodynamics, which is really, really stupid again. And this is the idea that fat loss or gain – or change in fat mass equals calories in minus calories out. Okay, so that's actually true. That's always true. But the problem is this. The calories in and the calories out are not independent variables. Okay, so if you increase your calories in and your calories out increases, or the other way around, so you reduce calories in, but calories out reduces, then fat mass is not changed at all. That is, if you eat 500 less calories and your body burns 500 less calories, which is what happens in the long term, not in the short term, then fat mass doesn't change. You've still fulfilled the first law of thermodynamics, but so what? And Gary Taubes goes over it very well, and I don't understand why anybody believes this whole first law of thermodynamics anymore. It's always correct, but completely irrelevant because it – it only talks to you about the proximal cause. So, for example, say you go to the airport. Say you go to, you know, the Toronto Pearson Airport. It's March break and it's completely packed. And you say to your friend, well, you know, this is packed. I wonder why it's so busy. And your friend says, wow, you're so stupid. Of course, there's more people coming in than people leaving. And then it's like, yeah, I know that's stupid, right? But <laughs> why are there more people here? And the answer is it's March break. That's the ultimate cause, right? Mm -hmm. The people coming in versus people leaving is proximal cause, but it's useless, right? Because if you believe that, and it's kind of like the same thing, it applies to everything, right? Alcoholism is too much alcohol in and too little alcohol out. So therefore, the only thing you need to know is to either reduce your metabolism, reduce your intake of alcohol or increase your metabolism of alcohol. Of course, it's so obvious. It's the first law of alcohol, alcoholic thermodynamics. Well, if you try to say that to an alcoholic, oh, you just have to drink less. They'd be like, what are you, stupid? Right? Yeah. 
<laughs> because sure it's, it's obvious. It's obviously not the answer. That's the proximal cause. The ultimate cause is that alcohol is addictive. Alcohol has social, there are social problems. If you're addicted to it, then you address the addiction, right? So you have Alcoholics Anonymous, you have behavior programs. What you don't have is people going around and saying, oh, you're an alcoholic. This is your fault. You just have to drink less, right? It's like so stupid. But at the same time, we have people going around, oh, you're obese. This is your fault. You should eat less. It's like, that doesn't work. Like, are you an idiot? We've done this for so many people. Absolutely. I mean, you, and you give a, a thorough treatment of that in your book, which is, uh, and you mentioned it here, kind of insulin being a fuel selector switch in a sense of high levels directing towards um, burning carbohydrate or, or fat storage versus low levels being able to liberate fat and use as a fuel source. Can you give the listeners a sort of an insulin 101? You, you used a great analogy there about the subway cars in, your, in one of your recent lectures, but uh, could you get everyone on the same page to, uh, on that note? Yeah, so as as long as you understand that calories is not the issue, then you can go back and say, well, what is the issue, right? So calories is only the proximal cause, right? It 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 doesn't tell you anything, right? So then you have to say, well, what does cause obesity, right? And when you get down to it, if you think something causes obesity, right, rather than just being linked to obesity, well, it has to pass the causal test. That is, you give something to somebody and they become obese. Well, it turns out I can make anybody obese. I just need to give them enough insulin, okay? So if I inject insulin into you, you would become obese. I just It's just a matter of how much insulin and how long. Your body would fight it, right? But eventually I could break it down with high enough doses. And it happens to all our patients. Every single person who takes insulin understands that it makes people gain weight. Not only that, and people say, well, you know, it's unphysiologic and stuff. You can take medications such as sulfonylureas, which increase the secretion of insulin, and you will gain weight. So it's physiologic insulin. And you can make somebody lose insulin. So type 1 diabetes, for example, people have very, very, very low levels of insulin. And guess what? They actually can't store any body fat. They start to go, uh, you know, become very, very thin and then they die because they don't have enough insulin. So it's too low. And that's the problem. So really, you can see that insulin is very intimately related to body fatness. So uh, the, that's the whole thing. And this is where it gets a little bit um, uh, more technical. So if you understand that insulin is the major cause of weight gain and obesity, right? So it tells the body to store fat and it tells the body to not burn fat as well. Okay. So it's a, it's, it's like those, you know, one way bridges where cars can only go in one direction. If somebody's coming the other way, you actually have to stop and let them through. That's the same as the body, right? You can either burn energy or you can store energy. You can't do both at the same time because it's not smart. And if insulin is high, you store energy. If insulin is low, you burn energy, right? So if you keep insulin levels high all the time, you're simply telling your body to keep storing energy and you're not going to burn the stored energy, which is glycogen in the liver and body fat. So that's the essential thing. So a lot of people say that carbohydrates, this is the so-called carbohydrate insulin hypothesis. That is, okay, we understand that insulin is the major cause of weight gain and what's the major cause of high insulin levels? Um, and some people say it's carbohydrates, but that's not entirely true. Refined carbohydrates for sure do stimulate insulin a lot, but it's not the only thing that impacts insulin. And this is where you have to understand about insulin resistance. And, and insulin resistance is the root cause of type 2 diabetes. Too much insulin resistance is the disease called type 2 diabetes. If you have resistance to insulin, that is insulin doesn't do what it's normally supposed to do. The body responds by increasing the dose, uh, increasing the amount of insulin. This is called compensatory hyperinsulinemia. And again, if you have insulin resistance, then your insulin levels are high. Well, if insulin levels are high, that's going to drive obesity. So here now, all of a sudden, you have a second factor. So other than the refined carbohydrates, you have insulin resistance, which is a key factor in keeping those insulin levels high and promoting obesity. So even if you didn't eat any carbohydrates or severely reduced it, as long as you had insulin resistance, you could still have too much insulin and therefore stay obese. And that's 
that's the, um, you know, and there are other things such as protein has a different effect on insulin. Sweeteners has effect on insulin, uh, things such as dietary fat, proteins, vinegar, all these sort of things can impact insulin levels. And certain one of them can be manipulated in order to lower insulin levels. But the key one is the insulin resistance. So then you have to go back and say, well, what causes insulin resistance? And that's, again, a more technical answer. But what happens is that the key is the liver, actually. So fatty liver is the major cause of insulin resistance. And this is where people have to understand what insulin resistance actually is. So insulin, one of its jobs is to promote glucose uh, entry into cells. So insulin tells the muscle cells, the liver cells. So let's stick with the liver. So it tells the liver cell to get glucose in. When we have insulin resistance, what we see is that you have a normal amount of insulin, but the glucose isn't going in. So we say, well, that's a problem of insulin resistance. But the question is, why isn't that glucose not going in? And what we say is that, well, there must be something that's kind of interfering with the mechanism. So this is the so-called lock and key uh, paradigm. So insulin acts like a key on the liver cell. It opens a gate, opens a door, lets the glucose in. And we say, well, there's something gumming up that lock and key mechanism because you can determine the molecular structure of insulin and the insulin receptor. And they're both completely normal on that liver cell in, in insulin resistance. So there's nothing wrong with the key. There's nothing wrong with the lock or door, but it's not working properly, right? The glucose is not going in. So why is that? And we say, well, there's something gumming up, like there's a piece of gum in the door sort of thing, right? So it's not working. So inside the cell, there's not enough glucose, and outside the cell, there's too much. But this is the whole problem. That entire paradigm is incorrect. So if you think about insulin resistance and you say that there's not enough glucose inside cells, there's internal starvation, then these people should look like type 1 diabetics. That is extremely skinny to the point of death like cachectic sort of thing. But yeah. that's not what type 2 diabetics look like. That's not what people with insulin resistance look like. They're obese. They have over big fatty livers. They have a big belly. They're not facing internal starvation. So the other possibility, which is, in my opinion, much more correct, uh, a different paradigm of what insulin resistance is, is that the cell is simply overstuffed with glucose. So even when you open the door, people can't the, the glucose can't go in. Just like if you have a bar that's kind of packed, you know, you have a van playing and there's so many people, you open the door, nobody can still go in. It doesn't matter if the door is open or closed. There's no room. It's like so my, you can't go my, in. Like my streetcar rides in uh, in the morning in Toronto. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. So you're, you're you're the door is open and you look at it and then you just let it close again. But on the outside, what it looks like is that there's something wrong. You say, well, there's resistance because you have a normal level of insulin. The doors are open and nobody's going in. But it's not that the door didn't open. The door did open. It's that the cell was too full. So you have this the liver, which is overstuffed with uh, glucose, which gets turned into fat, which is uh, through the process of de novo lipogenesis, that is excessive carbohydrates and particularly fructose are going to cause this fatty liver, which causes you to have insulin resistance, which causes the compensatory hyperinsulinemia, right? So insulin, uh, the body responds by producing more insulin with the thought that, hey, we need more insulin. That's the problem. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was the kind of overstuffed liver. So it's fatty liver that really causes the insulin resistance, which causes the high insulin levels, which uh, produces obesity. And this is the important thing. Because it that that insulin resistance needs to be kind of taken care of before you can actually treat obesity. Because if it's a major um, contributor to the high insulin levels, then even if you change your diet, but you don't get rid of that insulin resistance, you're still going to have obesity because your insulin levels are still going to be high. So that's where that insulin resistance piece is really so important because nobody really thinks about it. And it actually depends on several things. One, of course, is fructose. You got to get rid of the fructose because fructose, because of its metabolism, goes straight into the liver and causes fatty liver. 
right? And all the studies have shown that if you give people fructose versus glucose, for example, the fructose people will get fatty liver and the glucose people don't because the rest of your body can metabolize that glucose. That is, if you eat a pound of sugar, it's 50% glucose and 50% fructose. The 50 per, so a pound of sugar, half a pound of it is glucose. Your entire body metabolizes that glucose, but only your liver metabolizes the fructose. So like 200 pounds of body mass is metabolizing um, glucose and like five pounds of liver is metabolizing the fructose. And the thing is that the fructose can get turned into glucose, but why would you? You have plenty of glucose. So it gets turned into fat and it gets all stored in the liver. So you get fatty liver. In other words, the fructose is much, much, much worse than the glucose, which is the starches. So starchy foods is chains of glucose, but no fructose. I suppose so, today with getting up to about 160 pounds of sugar per person per year, you know, oh, 50, absolutely. 50% and, of which is the fructose you're mentioning, obviously people are now getting stuck in this position. As you mentioned, hyperinsulinemic, uh, they just cannot burn their own body fat stores as a fuel source or sort of just become sugar burners in effect. Yeah. And and that's the thing is that if if your if your problem is insulin resistance, and we know that prediabetes and diabetes affects about fifty percent of the kind of American population, then you say that's a very important thing that you have to treat before you can treat the obesity. So it's 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 important to understand that the insulin resistance, the resistance depends on one fructose, but also the sort of persistence of this uh, insulin. So if you're eating all the time, for example, and you're keeping your insulin levels all high all the time, because when you eat, insulin goes up. Unless you eat pure fat, which is rare, you don't eat sticks of butter for the most part. But if you, um, anytime you eat, as long as it has something other than pure fat, you're going to raise your insulin and your body's going to say, okay, I'm taking in energy. I need to store some of it, right? That's normal. If you keep doing that, you're not going to burn it and that, that, that fat is not going to be pulled out. So one of the things that we use quite uh, effectively is intermittent fasting because one of the things that we know is that very low calorie diets and fasting obviously is very low, uh, will preferentially pull out that fat from the liver because it's the most accessible fat. So when you fast, the first thing that goes down is your glucose because it takes the stored glycogen out. When the glycogen is gone, then you have to burn fat and it's a lot easier to take the fat from the liver than it is from the rest of your body because it's kind of sitting right there. So when they look, when you look at studies of fatty liver, for example, you can actually reduce the fatty liver far more than with, with fasting and very low calorie diets. And that's why they do that for uh, people undergoing bariatric surgery, for example. So they'll put them on extremely low diets or fasting for a week prior to surgery because they want to shrink that liver way down because surgically, if you've got a big fatty liver in your surgical field, it's just harder to operate. So you want that liver to shrink right down. And interestingly, when they do that to people, often the diabetes gets incredibly a lot better because you're actually targeting the actual problem, which is that big fatty liver. Um, and then after the surgery, of course, they can't eat. So they're basically, you know, going on these very low calorie diets again and, and shrinking that liver further. And that's really why the diabetes goes away very quickly, like within weeks, even though the body weight does not drop that quickly, because that's just the rest of the fat. It's the fat in the liver. That's the problem. Fat in the pancreas. That's the problem. Fat in the fat cell turns out to be not as big a deal as the fat that's there, the visceral fat. Terrific. And you mentioned in your books, you know, low carb ketogenic diets being very effective for reducing insulin and obese and pre-diabetic, diabetic patients. And, and perhaps the biggest metabolic hammer, which you just mentioned, is this idea of fasting of just don't eat anything. Can you discuss a little bit more about some of the benefits of fasting? And of course, fasting isn't really a new thing, is it? I mean, it's been around for uh, quite a few years, hasn't it? <laughs> Yeah, it's been around forever, actually, whether it was um, kind of unintentional or intentional. Uh, it's been around in one form or another forever. And the whole idea is that if you don't eat, your body knows how to handle that. As in, if you fast, and fasting is simply a period of time that you don't eat, your body will pull out the stored food energy that you stored from when you did eat. 
I mean, that's why we don't die every night when we go to sleep. Because we're not eating, we've stored away food energy, glycogen and body fat, and we'll pull it out and use it. So it's not a big deal. It's simply the way that we are designed because, you know, that's the way all mammals are designed. Otherwise, bears couldn't do it and tigers and lions who might eat once a week kind of thing. And even um, other uh, species such as fish and so on. I mean, if you have an aquarium, you know, you don't feed them like three times a day. Like, you know, when you have a five-year-old, they keep feeding them, feeding them, feeding them. And they get really sick. And yet we feed ourselves, we get told by our kind of nutritional authority, oh, you should eat six times a day. I'm like, why don't you give your fish like six times a day meals? See how they do, right? They do really badly. In fact, a lot of times you should feed them every other day kind of thing. And it's like, but for ourselves, like we don't take that advice. We think that, oh, as soon as you miss a single meal, oh no, you're going to like die. Right, and it's like that doesn't happen, right? And, and that's simply, something that we've definitely, as a you know, in terms of the nutrition, dietitian, medical profession, we've been, yeah, we've instilled that fear that everyone's just going to collapse and fall over. And you know, you talk about yeah. this idea of getting back to three square meals, and how even you know that plays a major role in this idea of actually not eating for about twelve hours and eating for twelve hours. Which today, the window for most people, they start eating at six or seven in the morning, and they have their last snack on the couch at eleven p.m. So the it's just a total discordance there. Can you can you touch on that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you go back simply to the 50s or 60s, you got to realize they're eating white bread and Oreo cookies too. But the difference is that they're not eating constantly. So again, you can either store energy or you can burn energy. So if you spend all your time storing energy, guess what? You're going to gain weight. So you got to let your body have a chance to pull that energy that you've taken in your meals back out and burn it. So you want to balance your feeding and fasting windows. That is the t- period of time that your body is high in insulin and the period of time that it's low in insulin. So as long as you ba- balance them, then you're going to not gain weight. And you know nobody ate whole wheat pasta in the 70s. Nobody ate whole wheat bread. I mean, I grew up then, right? Very few people. It's all wonder bread, white bread. And yet there was very little obesity. But what we didn't have was the snacks. You'd come home and you'd say, Can I have a snack? And then your mom would say, No, you can't. Exactly. You're going to ruin your dinner. Or it's like, we have nothing to eat, right? That was my, my usual response, right? We have nothing to eat. Wait till dinner. So there's nothing to eat. What are you going to do? You go outside and play. So now we went from the idea that you shouldn't eat snacks to the idea that you should eat like the minute you roll out of bed. Like don't even let your feet hit the floor before you start stuffing a sand, you know, some bread into your mouth, right? Like For why? Sure. What's the point of that? And even the very word itself breakfast. It's the meal that breaks your fast, which means that fasting is an integral part of everyday life. That is, if you eat for 10 or 12 hours and you fast for 12 or 14 hours, that's balance, right? You start eating for all the time that you're awake, all of a sudden that balance is gone and you're going to gain weight. And uh, all the trials show that. So the NHANE surveys from 1977 show that people are eating three meals a day. 2004, it's closer to six meals a day or six eating opportunities. And that's because we've told people to do that, right? It's not that they wanted to do that. We told them, oh yeah, you should have a you know, snack in the morning and snack after school and snack before you go to bed. And that's going to make you gain, uh, make you lose weight. And it doesn't. And so that's the idea is that you really want to have that your, your life in balance. It's, it's really just have kind of fallen out of that balance. And that's played a big part. Now, if you simply go back to that balance, you're not going to lose weight that fast. So you actually have to extend those fasting periods and you can go out to 16, 18, 20 hours, 24 hours, and you can go into even more multi-day fast if if uh, people are very ambitious because again all you do is you start burning fat that's what your body does your body stores sugar and fat and when you don't eat it burns the sugar burns the fat right that's that's really uh, all that happens it's incredible how you know how simplistic it can be at, to a certain degree and of course in your book the complete guide to fasting you, you go into the details and some of those details are breaking a lot of the myths around fasting because people are worried even people who are tremendously overweight worried about going to starvation mode worried about burning moth muscle worried about low blood sugars can you can you dispel a few of those myths for us yeah, I mean, the whole thing about uh, – there's several. So starvation mode. What the idea is that if you 
and go into starvation mode, your basal metabolic rate drops, so you're burning less calories, and that's what everybody calls starvation mode. So what's completely ironic about that is that if you simply reduce your calories every day, keep the same meal structure, kind of five, six meals a day, but simply control your portion size, you are guaranteed to go into starvation mode. That is, if you eat 2,000 calories a day normally and you burn 2,000 because you're not gaining or losing weight, now you want to lose 20 pounds. So you go down to 1,500 calories, uh, what you take in. Well, your body will sense that and very quickly go down to 1,500 calories a day and actually go slightly below that. It'll be like 1,400 calories a day. Then what's going to happen, initially you'll lose weight, but then it'll plateau and then it'll go back up. But because you're only burning 1,500 calories instead of 2,000, you're going to feel cold, tired, hungry. You're going to feel like crap. And at the end of a year, you haven't lost any weight. So it's the worst of all possible worlds. And we know that happens. We've had studies going back 100 years that tells us exactly what happens. You do that kind of calorie restriction, you will lose weight. Uh, sorry, you will go into starvation mode. So what's ironic is that what doesn't cause starvation mode, which is a really bad name, honestly, is actual starvation. So if you don't eat for four days straight, what happens to your basal metabolic rate? Well, the studies show that it's actually 10% higher at the end of your four-day fast than when you started. Right? And that's fascinating. If you do studies of alternate daily fasting where you eat one day, don't eat one day, what they find again is that there was no change in the basal metabolic rate. But the people who just tried to restrict their calories, they did drop their basal metabolic rate. So those people who were using portion control go into starvation mode. And what's the difference? Everybody asks me what the difference is. The difference is that when you fast, your body cannot burn zero calories, right? You'll die. So it actually switches fuel sources. When your insulin goes down, your, your body burns through your sugar. Once it burns through your sugar, it starts burning fat. So you're actually switching fuel sources. So now your body's like, oh, it wants to burn 2,000 calories because that's where it was. And it's like, whoa, there's tons of fat here. So let's burn it. Why would I reduce the amount I'm burning? I'm just going to burn it. And if you look, and, and one of the reasons that that happens is that there is something called counter-regulatory hormones. And counter-regulatory hormones are hormones that basically counter insulin. So insulin makes blood glucose goes, go down. That is, it makes glucose goes into cells. And counter-regulatory hormones make glucose go up. So when your insulin goes down, your counter-regulatory hormones go up so that you pull back out the sugar so that you don't die. Those hormones are things such as noradrenaline and growth hormone and cortisol. So it is a stress on the body, just like exercise is a stress on the body. And if cortisol, too much cortisol is your main problem, well, fasting may not be your best option either. But that's part of the response. So the body actually starts to begin to activate itself, right? And that makes sense from a survival standpoint because if you don't eat and you start to shut down your body, you will never eat again because if you thought you couldn't catch that rabbit you know, before, after you shut down 25%, you're never going to catch that rabbit. Absolutely. So your body is not quite that stupid. What it does is it switches fuel sources – and pumps us up. So you go out, you have lots of energy. And people who do the fasting have actually noticed this. Some people have so much energy they can't sleep at night. And then they always complain about it. And people feel that they have, uh, you know, before they're sluggish and now they have lots of energy because we're liberating that fuel source of the body fat. Before you couldn't use it because you kept eating all the time. Your insulin levels stayed high all the time, especially if you have insulin resistance. Insulin stays high all the time. You're telling your body to store energy. So it's all getting locked away and you're not using it. So if you have like, you know, you're trying to burn wood, but instead you're just storing more and more firewood, right? And then, you know, opening up more things, but you're never burning it. So we want, what, what the fasting does is it kind of offers you a quick hack, if you will, to get into that fat burning mode, to move into that the area where you can burn it. Once your body's able to burn it, it has no reason to lower its metabolic rate. So you don't get the starvation mode. And that's a huge advantage for weight loss because if you simply uh, drop your metabolism every time you drop you know, a few calories, 
you're in a dead end. You lower calories in, your body shuts down. Then you lower it a bit more, then your body shuts down a bit more. Then you lower it more, then your body shuts down a bit more. Then you feel like crap, so you go back up, and then you gain all the weight back. Absolutely. Right? I mean, it's, it's fascinating stuff around uh, what you mentioned with the growth hormone response with fasting and just how that protects muscle mass, just as you mentioned from this evolutionary standpoint of you know, how else would we have survived for weeks or months on end with very little to no food unless we had these compensatory mechanisms. So it's really fascinating those types of responses now yeah. you touched on cortisol which is obviously a big player and in your your book you mentioned how you can make somebody fat as well by by giving them pregnazone shots um can you touch a bit on that cortisol and that sleep connection to this whole story yeah i actually think the cortisol uh, story is is very very interesting because what it shows is that it's not simply insulin there are other hormones but insulin is probably the major one if you give somebody synthetic cortisol in the form of prednisone, and we do this all the time, people with asthma, people with lupus, people with rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases. So you can take a normal person who has, say, asthma, give them big whacking doses of prednisone because of their asthma, and they'll gain weight. Now, everybody knows this. this is a well-known side effect. And uh, what happens, of course, is that cortisol is one of those counter-regulatory hormones. And so glucose glucose tends to get liberated from your body um, to, to, uh, in response to cortisol. So the problem is that cortisol is not supposed to stay up all the time. Right? It's supposed to go up and then go back down. So if you see a lion, your heart rate shoots up, cortisol goes way up, then you run like hell or you get eaten. Either way, cortisol drops after that. Right, So you'll either be dead or you're going to be safe and then your cortisol is like few so it's not supposed to stay up all the time but we can do that um experimentally we can do that with uh, prednisone for other reasons right it's kind of a side effect when cortisol stays up all the time then what happens is that your body is actually trying to burn through muscle and burn through fat and liberate it but the problem is that the glucose goes up and it's not supposed to be up so when you give big doses of cortisol it stays up all the time which then winds up causing insulin to go up so now you've got cortisol up and insulin up so at the same time your body is trying to produce glucose it's trying to store glucose right and so you get this kind of uh, unphysiologic uh, thing so the problem is that in modern day life, there's a lot of stress that doesn't go away. So if you have, say, financial difficulties and you worry all the time, well, your cortisol is going to be up, but it's not supposed to stay up all the time. If you are sleep deprived, you may have the same thing. So every, a lot of people understand that sleep deprivation causes weight gain or makes it easier to gain weight. But lack of sleep has no calories it also has no carbohydrates so you have to say well it's it's really a hormonal issue right so it's not really a carbohydrate thing it's not really a calorie thing what the body understands right the language of the body is hormones so obesity at its very core is a hormonal imbalance it's not a caloric imbalance right if you once you start getting down into the calories you've missed the whole boat you got to correct the hormones which are telling your body to gain fat okay. so cortisol does that insulin does that but if cortisol is your problem then you have to fix that and and if you change your diet you may not fix the, the underlying issue. So we see this all the time. People are losing weight, they're doing well, and then they go through a very stressful period in their life for whatever reason. And the weight loss just kind of stops or it goes back up and they, they're gaining weight like crazy. And you might say, well, because they're getting comfort food and so on. And I suppose that might be true, but a lot of people swear that it's not. And, but the stress itself will do it to you. The cortisol itself will do it to you. Absolutely. So this I mean, is the interesting thing about that whole uh, issue. And in your book, The Obesity Code, I mean, it's, you go through all these research, which is tremendous. And, you know, a single night of sleep deprivation, you see 37 to 45% increase in cortisol the next morning. Five nights of sleep restriction, we're seeing a 20% greater output of insulin. Uh, and then the, the effect of these glucocorticoids and cortisol on suppressing adiponectins, which impact um, body fatness. So it's amazing how all this becomes tied together and of course you've got some great solutions uh, in there as well 
Now, if we if we shift back to to the idea of, of, of fasting, and I know apart from the blood sugar and weight loss benefits, there's other benefits as well, isn't there, in terms of cognitive function, some of these anti aging benefits, inflammatory. Can you touch on those a little bit? Yeah, and that's a lot more theoretical. Um, there's uh, several things. One is in terms of um, aging, cancer, that kind of thing. There's a process called autophagy, which is a where your body breaks down these kind of old junk subcellular proteins and it breaks it down and gets rid of them and everybody thinks that's really bad they say oh you're burning protein but it's not a bad thing it's a fact it's a good thing because uh, if you have old broken down things you need to get rid of them you can throw them out so the body actually uh, self digests it and then uses it so when you eat again your growth hormone is up and you can rebuild it so in fact what you're doing is you're taking down old protein and building new protein and that's very very powerful because in essence what you're doing is kind of renewing yourself and it's almost like you're kind of reversing some of the changes of aging because if you leave those old junky kind of proteins around it's kind of like the show hoarders right where you have these houses full of like old you know pizza boxes and stuff that's what happens when you don't throw stuff out well you're body is the same it's got to throw stuff out sometimes and the process of autophagy is turned off very quickly by when you eat so and it's very exquisitely sensitive to actually to protein so if you eat protein um, during a fast you'll actually turn off that autophagy uh, because what happens is that during a fast where you eat nothing just drink water for example then your body has nutrient sensors. Insulin is a nutrient sensor, and there's something called mTOR, which is a nutrient sensor. And if it senses that you're taking in protein, it will tell the body to stop the autophagy, right? But you want that autophagy to go on because you want to get rid of those old cells. And there's people who have theorized that that will play a very important role to prevent, say, Alzheimer's disease, where you do have a lot of this protein kind of clogging up the brain. There's other people who say that it will get rid of cancer cells in the early stages, for example, um, because you'll activate, your body's going to want to try and get rid of stuff, which is why these longer fasts used to be called cleanses, right? You're trying to clean out your body from that all that old stuff. And it's actually very true. That's exactly what it does. Um, so those are some of the benefits and anti-inflammatory, it's the same thing. Some people say that it kind of resets the immune system. And then when you eat again, you kind of, your body will sense what proteins you're deficient in and build them because your growth hormone is activated now. Um, so it's, it's a very powerful idea. A lot of these, uh, other benefits don't have a lot of research behind them, but it kind of makes sense. And I'm sure that we'll see a lot more research kind of going forward. The cognitive benefits have actually been documented for, again, for thousands of years. So it was the ancient Greeks who first uh, fasted for cognitive benefits. I don't know if first, but they're the most famous ones. And so what they would do is fast, and it wasn't because they were, they were obese or they had type 2 diabetes, which was very rare back in the ancient world, but they did it because they thought it made them think better because the ketones that are produced may actually be burned by the brain better. And a lot of people have kind of noticed this as well. So the, all the ancient Greeks, for example, there's stories of how Pythagoras, the famous mathematician, would um, make his students fast before they came into class so they weren't so, so that they could function at a higher level. We still talk about the ancient Greek philosophers and so on. You know, there are certain books uh, that are written about the Japanese, uh, the, the American prisoners of war in Japan, and they would describe these amazing feats of kind of mental agility. You know, in one book they talked about, for example, reading an entire book through in his memory alone and people learning Norwegian in a week kind of thing, like amazing things. And it was funny because in that, in that one book that I was reading, uh, they're talking about, Oh, these are the amazing feats, uh, you know, associated with starvation. And it's like, everybody knew how smart you get. For in sure. The past. And, uh, that's really interesting. So again, there's people who will use that and say, well, you know what? So there's a group in Silicon Valley, for example, called WeFast, and they 
uh, are a bunch of kind of young 20-ish something computer geniuses who do the fasting not because they're overweight but because they want an edge. So it's a, kind of an ultimate hack for them to be able to think better because when you think better, you're going to advance more and it turns into good ideas and success in life all from fasting which is completely free and it's like wow that's really really interesting because those benefits have been written about for thousands of years and is available to anybody absolutely and that on that note of having an edge i mean if we shift context a little bit to, to athletes do you think there's some benefit uh, perhaps it's in the off season or periods of lower training uh for athletes to dip their toe into this a little bit or is a more of a ketogenic approach probably probably more appropriate where, where would you see or or hypothesize around some benefits there Oh, I think that intermittent fasting has its place in athletics. There's a lot of people who talk about training in the fasted state, which is where you fast for a period of time. Now, there's a period of adaptation. So there's two things that people talk about. So for ketogenic diets, for example, they talk about getting the muscles used to burning fat, which absolutely happens. So the studies where they do muscle biopsies and they look, they actually show that the genes necessary for fat burning – are increased when you go on these ketogenic diets. In other words, your muscle gets more used to burning fat, so you can actually use it for energy. So a lot of these ultra marathoners and kind of Tour de France and ultra endurance athletes, you can carry so much more energy in the form of fat than you can in sugar. So in the old days where we talked about carb loading and all that sort of thing, well, that carb really runs out of steam pretty fast, whereas the body fat doesn't. So if you rely on your body for energy and one of the books um what was that book the one on running uh born free or something like that yep the one about the super runners and all they were eating was this paste of chia seed right so they're basically running on fat and it's amazing because they would go for these huge distances without any problems and it's like wow that's amazing it's because they had so much energy stored from their body fat which you're now accessing yeah it's amazing so, how even a lean person who's running especially the ultra events i mean even if someone at 10 percent body fat's got about thirty thousand calories of energy so it is a, yeah, it is an, an untapped amazing. resource now now jason where do you so, see the evolution of this of the fight against uh, you know type two diabetes and obesity with using you know dietary interventions using fasting and will we ever see the day where type two diabetes is, is called more appropriately carbohydrate intolerance disease? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's getting there. I mean, carbohydrate intolerance is not a term I generally use because it's not so much the carbohydrates, which is my focus. My focus is on the insulin, right? I think that the disease of type 2 diabetes is really a disease of too much insulin. That's basically it. Everybody says it's a disease of insulin resistance, but that doesn't give you the answer so i never I, I try not to say that people understand what insulin resistance kind of is for sure but it's a really too much insulin is the problem and when you when you frame it that way it's much more powerful because if you say the problem is too much insulin the solution is obvious lower insulin how are you going to do that? Low-carb diets, ketogenic diets, intermittent fasting. They all have the same goal because none of them, keto diets for example, the goal is not to reduce calories. The goal is to reduce insulin, right? You use the carbohydrates, you reduce the carbohydrates to do that. But you can actually follow a relatively high carbohydrate diet as long as it's unprocessed and there's lots of fiber and all this sort of stuff and For you don't sure. eat all the time. Because this is the where people get into arguments, right? Because they say, well, look at the Okinawans, look at the Katavans, look at um, uh, the Chinese in the 1990s. They're eating white rice and vegetables all day, day in, day out. Super high carbohydrate intake, no obesity. And what was the difference? Well, you're not eating sugar, right? Fructose is way by far and away the worst thing. And they're eating none of it. And they're not eating all the time. They're eating one or two times a day because they were out in the field, you know, plowing their fields and so on. Um, so there's a lot of uh, ways to get to that state of low insulin, not necessarily restricting your carbohydrates. If you eat a lot of beans, hey, beans don't get absorbed that much. There's not that much of an insulin effect. So you can do reasonably well with that. And that's where I think that I've kind of uh, have more of an insulin kind of uh, centric approach rather than a carbohydrate approach because a carbohydrate approach it completely ignores the insulin resistance piece of it, right? Because you go carbs, insulin, um, obesity, 
um, kind of where's you know where's fructose in all that, right? Uh, fructose Absolutely. does not raise insulin directly. You take fructose, insulin doesn't go up. So why is that bad, right? So according to the carb insulin hypothesis, it wouldn't be bad. And for a lot of long time, people said it wasn't bad, but it is. That's just common sense, and it actually acts through insulin resistance and then compensatory hyperinsulinemia. So I actually consider type two diabetes actually the entire metabolic syndrome. And that is high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low HDL abdominal obesity. Really what we should do is consider these all diseases of hyperinsulinemia. Just like you say, oh, somebody's hyperthyroid. Well, okay, then now I know what to do. I need to lower that thyroid. I give this drug or PTU or whatever I give, right? Now I understand what I need to do. Same thing with insulin. It's a hyperinsulinemic state. This too much insulin is the disease. Therefore, lower insulin, right? We're not specifically carbohydrates, right? Because if you say, oh, well, you know, it's too much carbohydrates, lower carbohydrates, sure, that, that is one way to do it, but it's not the only way to do it, right? Exactly. And that's, that's where I kind of differ slightly. I mean, it's, it's kind of just the way to think about it that's a slightly different because I, that, that gives me more flexibility because there's so many more inputs into insulin than merely carbohydrates. You can adjust fiber. You can adjust uh, protein. You can adjust dietary fat. You can adjust vinegar. You can adjust eating times. You can ad adjust cortisol. Right, and it's like cortisol has no carbohydrates, right? But these things such as meditation and 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 things that work on the cortisol pathways wind up being effective as well for weight loss. Not to the same extent, perhaps, as fasting, but nevertheless. So I, I see it more as a what we need to do is recognize a sort of new paradigm of insulin resistance, understand what insulin resistance actually is, so that we can kind of get to the point where we say, well, this is a disease of hyperinsulinemia. Lower the insulin. That's it. Phenomenal. Right? But Phenomenal. you could do that with various measures. Very very well said. That's that's terrific, Jason. Now, I want to respect your time here. I thank you so much for making the time today. Last question here. Uh, time to get a little bit personal. Can you tell us about your morning routine? We like to I like to geek out about coffee here in the morning. Are you a coffee drinker? Do you like to have tea in the morning? What does your routine look like? Yeah, I drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so every morning I drink coffee pretty well. Um, I'm probably addicted to it. But <laughs> nevertheless, um, my morning routine is fairly simple. I mean, I wake up and I get my coffee and that's it. And that I don't stress. I, I, I don't eat breakfast probably five days out of seven when I'm working. Uh, it's probably, you know, seven days out of seven. I don't. I don't miss it at all. I mean, I've gotten used to not eating it and my body will supply energy. So as I'm sleeping, I know my body is pulling energy back out so that I don't die. I simply extend the time. So I keep burning fuel when I'm at work. And now it's like, you know, it's one o'clock, one twenty. I still haven't eaten, right? And now it's time to go to work. So I'll just kind of keep going because otherwise I have to stop and it breaks up my day. So uh, in the morning, I really don't do anything special. I just get up, shower, and go to work, get my coffee, go to work. So much easier, right? And that's, that's one of the things S that is... Uh, simple, simple, efficient, effective. You know, it's uh, it's tremendous. Your book's The Obesity Code and The Complete Guide to Fasting. Phenomenal, phenomenal resources, whether they're docs, nutritionists, trainers out there, or just uh, enthusiasts, people trying to improve their health. I would highly recommend both of them. Uh, Jason, thanks so much for taking the time today. Where can people pick up the books and where can people keep tabs on your uh, latest projects? Yeah, so um, the books are available everywhere. Uh, Amazon is probably the easiest place to get books, really. Um, but they're available at bookstores, chapters in Canada, Barnes & Noble in the U.S. And uh, my website is www.intensivedietarymanagement. Uh, the other place to go for really great resources is www.dietdoctor.com. And that has great, that's run by Andreas Enfeldt, and uh, I'm on it as well. Uh, but it's a great resource on recipes and articles and interesting things going on in the kind of uh, low-carb nutrition world. So that has 
you know, terrific uh, things for everybody it has a great uh, section on fasting, has a great section on kind of meal plans and low carb sort of thing. So those are the those are the places to go. I think that the um, you know I do have a book that will come out probably next year, which will be specific to type two diabetes. The obesity code was sort of a kind of a preamble almost dealing with the obesity part of things. Yep, and then I talk more about the kind of new paradigms of insulin resistance and how it explains uh, metabolic syndrome and all of that. Uh, for So if people want to uh, reverse their diabetes or prediabetes, then that's the, that's the idea is that somebody can read it and then just understand everything there is to understand and say, hey, I can just follow this kind of dietary plan and boom, I can reverse my disease. Phenomenal, Jason. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out today. And uh, thanks again for everyone else tuning in. As always, you can find all the links in a podcast summary in the show notes at drbubs.com forward slash podcast. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you on Facebook or Twitter at Dr. Bubs. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe and give us a five-star rating on iTunes. And until next time, thanks for listening. The Dr. Bubs Performance Podcast endeavors to provide accurate and helpful information to listeners. These podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Dr. Bubs Performance Podcasts.